I really do love women. I guess most of you do. Uh, all of us, every sing of, uh, single one of you in here, and all, uh, every human being on this planet is actually born from a woman's body. And uh, nobody really seems to remember that when it comes down to salaries, pensions, violence against women, and all other injustices in this world. We don't think about it that much, but I do think about this a lot. I do think about how the world is depending on the female body. And we depend on it so much, so we have to control it. We have to buy it, we have to sell it, uh, and ultimately destroy it. I also think about men a lot. I think about men's behavior. And I have to admit that I really love men as well. Not all men, though. Uh, mostly the ones who are brave enough to take a stand when they have to, to choose a side. And I'm also the mother of a son. Uh, he's the best thing that ever happened to me. He didn't really happen to me. He didn't fall from the sky. Every cell in my body was needed to create him. And now he's here. And he and all the other children in the world, they really deserve a better place to grow up in than the one we have created for them right now. My name is Olga Persson, and I'm the president of Unison. That's an umbrella organization for more than 130 women's shelters and young women's empowerment centers around Sweden. And I've been working in the women's shelter movement since 20 years. My mission in life is that women and girls should survive, the survival of women and girls. But also that we should live our life the way we want to, and that we should enjoy life, at least some of the time. It's a very easy mission to understand, I guess all of you agree, and yet it's very difficult to achieve. And this paradox, or the elephant in the room, if you would call it that, is what I'm going to talk a little bit about today. Sweden is one of the most gender equal countries in the world. Uh, it's considered to be, at least, and I don't disagree. That's a basic fact. We strive for gender equality. Uh, we have a government that calls itself feminist. But at the same time, we are no great exception when it comes to men's violence against women. For example, the past 10 years, uh, the reported cases of men's violence against other men has decreased, despite all the media attention it gets. But at the same time, reported cases uh, of men's violence against women has increased. And why is that? Is it that the actual violence against women uh, increases in Sweden? Or is it the willingness, the bravery of all these women who report the crimes to the police that is increasing? But if it is the bravery and the willingness of the women, is it so that the men are not willing to report these crimes to the police? We don't know that for sure yet, but what we do know is that we have a long way to go until we see women as full human beings, uh, equal in dignity and rights as men. And what would a society look like that truly loved and respected women? I have a few suggest suggestions how we could get there. First of all, we have to stop blaming women for men's behavior. The women's movement in Sweden has created one of the most decent societies in the world. It is illegal to beat children, uh, even if you are the parent. Uh, we have a legislation uh, against violation of women's integrity that actually looks at the systematics of violence against women in relationships. And we also criminalized the purchase of so-called sexual services more than 20 years ago. And now we have even put down in legislation that sex is a mutual act based on real consent. 
None of this would exist if it wasn't for the women's movement. And so much has actually changed in Sweden the last 40 years. But the questions we are asked about men's violence against women from the public are quite the same. Why doesn't she leave? Well, first of all, she does. Women leave violent men all over the world every day. They walk out the door uh, with nowhere to go and often with no money and they bring their children. Some women are killed just because of this, just because they decided to leave him. Others are hunted down for decades by men who cannot accept a no. And as in any war, there are no safe human corridors out of the war. Would you dare to leave? Most of us are afraid to leave relationships without any violence just because we are afraid to be alone. The question I'd like to ask is why doesn't he leave the relationship? Why does he want to spend his life with someone he calls a whore or mentally ill? Why does he want to spend his life with a useless mother that he calls ugly, stupid and fat? Secondly, we are not using the correct language when we describe this violence. When society talks about these violence crimes, uh, we don't dare or we don't care enough to tell it like it is. We have a need to soften it. We call it violence in close relationships. I think we all should agree that close relationships, that intimacy, by definition, doesn't include rape, threatening to kill someone, choking, or kicking a pregnant stomach. That is not intimacy and it's not closeness. After listening to women's stories for more than 20 years, I hear something far away from intimacy and closeness. I hear men who invade women, men who don't take no for an answer, and men who pretend that they don't understand basic human interaction. To understand the big picture, we need to see the women behind the statistics. We need to see and truly understand that the women who now are dead by the hands of men in Sweden once were alive. Human beings who will be missed forever by me and by their families. Between 2000 and until now, at least 320 women were killed by the hands of men. The women were aged from 15 to 91 years old. They worked at, as waitresses, lawyers, cleaners, security guards, psychologists, office staffs, cooks, cabin crews, train conductors. They were killed using ordinary things that you can find in any home, like knives, frying pans, or telephone cables. Most of them were beaten to death in their homes in the bathroom, in the living room, on the threshold, in the attic. The most common murder scene was the woman's own bed. And the cause of death was being a woman. A woman who wanted to live her own life. These women, these mothers, left behind more than 300 underage children. And in more than half the cases, it was the biological father who killed the mother. And some of the children were, of course, at home. They tried to intervene. And some of the children had been living with violence since they were inside their mother's bodies. And most politicians would say that this is an unacceptable situation, of course. But still, many of these children are forced by a Swedish court to continue to see the murderer, to continue to see the person who killed or assaulted their mother. About a third of the children who experienced the worst, where the father killed the mother, still has the murderer as their guardian, legal guardian. 
And these fathers control the children from prison, just as any parent, and they can decide whether the children should change school, get vaccinated, travel abroad, or get psychological, psychological help. The third reason why women do not survive in our society is that we fail to identify with these victims, with these women. We fail to take a stand. If you can see her, you can be her. When Kamala Harris became vice president in the US, people were shouting, if you can see her, you can be her. The fact that a woman uh, with roots in both Jamaica and India now has one of the most powerful offices in the world give hope and inspiration to millions of women around the world. There is a feminist consensus that it's important with role models. And it's very easy to identify with people higher up. But what happens if you turn your gaze downwards or to the side? To the women below or beside us? We all live in a porn culture, uh, even if you're Kamala Harris, uh, or if you're an uh, Ukrainian woman fleeing the war right now, risking to end up in a brothel in Europe. Today, it's almost impossible to distinguish uh, glamour models, influencers uh, on social media from what people call pornography. You only have to read out the most popular titles on the world's biggest porn site to understand the content. And you don't need to be an expert or a researcher to see that they don't contribute to gender equality between men and women. Slutty teens mouthfucked until they puke. Many women find this very painful to take this in, that this is our cultural image of women, of who you are. But that image, it's just as true as Kamala Harris as vice president in the US. The women are every bit as real. This week, uh, a uh, $500 million class action lawsuit uh, was filed against one of the biggest porn companies in the world on behalf of all victims in Canada that has had illegal, non-consensual images and videos on this site for 15 years, including the worst crimes you can ever imagine, like child abuse, rape and trafficking. The law firm filing this suit put it this way. We are talking about a business built on underage, non-consensual and pirated content. And as my dear friend, uh, Professor Gail Dines used to put it, we know abuse when we see it, unless it is women who are being hurt. If you would see a man choking or spitting or slapping on another man on the street, you would probably react. And you would react if you saw a man choking and spitting on a woman on the street. But if you see it in pornography, it's called sex. The pornography industry teaches men that women are whores and sluts. And this is what real men want. And it radicalizes men in hatred of women. Most people say they want equality. And most people say they love women as I do. But what does it mean to love women in a society like ours? I have dedicated my life to the survival of women and girls. And while doing that, I think we also contribute to a better world for men and boys, because the world is so depending on the well-being of women. And men who commit crimes against women and girls has to be punished, of course, by the rule of law. Accountability is extremely important. Boundaries cross must mean consequences. It's crystal clear, and most of us agree. And to sum this up, my small recommendations, and to close the gap between my mission and what we have today. Stand with women and girls. Believe in her. You don't need a master's in human rights or in economics to do that. And stand up against these societal double standards that we have. 
Strangulation is not sex. It's a deadly, fatal action that kills women around the world every day. And hold men accountable for their behavior, legally and in everyday life. In Sweden, around 5% of all the reported cases of rape lead to conviction. This impunity, of course, has to end. Women are human beings, and only when we truly see women as human beings, we can achieve the full potential of mankind, or womankind, I guess. And try it once. It feels good to actually honor the women who gave you your life. So I wish you happiness and love, and thank you for listening.